may be called someday. To testify in a courtroom, stand in front of a jury, sit in, uh, on, the, uh, on the witness stand, and you may be called to testify about your faith in Jesus Christ. Today we're uh, doing the fourth leg of our mission statement, which is putting legs to faith. We began uh, the first week with loving God. God has called us to love him. And Jesus, in describing the, the greatest commandment, says not only are we supposed to love God, but we're supposed to love one another. And in fact, John said, if you don't love one another, then how can you say you love God? So they go together. First leg was loving God and loving one another. The second leg is encouraging one another. And by the way, we're, we're using the acrostic L-E-G-S. Got it? So the second one is encouraging one another. To encourage one another, it comes from the word for the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the comforter. The Holy Spirit comes alongside of us, encourages, strengthens, comforts us, sometimes even convicts us, yes? Sometimes points out things in our life because if we're going to really grow, we shouldn't just be told, oh, yeah, oh, you're wonderful when you're not wonderful, right? And God so shows us some of those things. And the Holy Spirit has the, this great gift of doing that for us. But the Holy Spirit also will pray for us when we can't pray. With, literally, with groanings too deep for words. The Holy Spirit also is the one that empowers us. Gives us, literally, the power of God. In fact, if you think about it, when we invited Jesus Christ to come into our lives, it's actually the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, that is dwelling within us. And then, incidentally, the Spirit is the wind, the breath of God. And if we're, as, as we live, we're trying to take in the breath, the very power, the life of God in us. And we want to encourage one another as we do that. The third leg is um, that we are growing as Christ's disciples. Uh, and and <laughs> we're all growing, right? Some of us are growing taller. Some of us are growing wider. Some of us are growing simply older. Uh, some of us are, but we're all growing, hopefully. Now, the question is, are you growing as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you growing to become more like Jesus? Because that's what it means to be growing as Christ's disciple. And also, if you're growing as Christ's disciple, you're going to be growing in our fourth leg. You're going to be growing in your sharing Jesus. Yes, is for sharing Jesus. We have been given an incredible gift. We've been praying about it earlier. We've been singing about it throughout the morning worship already. An incredible gift. Jesus Christ died on the cross for us because he loves us. That's the gift. And if we want to, we can accept the payment that he paid on that cross. We can be forgiven of our sins. We can be made into new people because of what Jesus has done for us. And then we get to share that with someone else. Now, don't parents take their children right from the, some of the earliest ages and try to teach them to do what with their toys? Share their toys. They teach them to share their toys. And it's funny because sometimes I, I'll watch parents doing this, and they're like, you know, you need to share that. And little kid's like, you know, excuse me, this is mine. I mean, they can't even speak yet, right? But they know that that toy is theirs. And, and, the, and mom, you just took my favorite toy and gave it to that boy over there. What are you doing? It's, it's hard for them to understand sharing. I'm afraid that sometimes it's hard for us to understand sharing Jesus. The text we're going to look at this morning is uh, Acts 26. And Paul is in front of two rulers. And he's literally on trial in front of the two of them. See, in fact, in Mark 13, it says, Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say what is ever, whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Remember that verse, okay? And here's why I say remember that. Too many Christians are afraid to talk to somebody else about Jesus. Too many Christians think, well, I don't know, I won't know what to say. Isn't that one of the, you think about it. How, what have your excuses been? I, I won't know how to answer. I, know, I won't know what to say to them. I won't know how to convince them. It's not your job. I, 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 I just, I, I'm afraid. I just don't know how to do it. Really? What did this verse just say? Quit worrying about that. When you're called on to share, simply let the Spirit speak through you, and the Spirit of God will. We're waiting too long to try to get all the expert information and insights that we're never going to get 
because we're not going to get it unless we go out there and jump in the pool and start swimming. That's a whole other illustration. Okay? Some of us are trying to learn about swimming by never getting in the pool. Some of us are trying to teach swimming. Some of us just need to jump in and do it. And that's what Mar Jesus is saying right here in Mark. I will tell you what to do. The Spirit of God will tell you what to say. But you've got to go talk. And James 1.12 says, Bless is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. There was another shooting this week. at a high school. A high school student shot some of his friends. The mom of the 15-year-old girl who was killed in Kentucky speaks about her daughter. 15-year-old Bailey Holt had only recently started at Marshall County High School in Kentucky when she fell prey to the shooter who killed two and injured 16 on Tuesday. The teen known as a perfect angel with a heart of gold called her mother in her final moments just before a fellow student took her life. Was it because she'd already been shot? Had the shooting already begun? She called me and all I could hear was voices, chaos in the background, says her mom. She couldn't say anything and I tried to call her name over and over and over and she never responded. We rushed to the high school and they wouldn't let us get through. Bailey's boyfriend of six months was one of the other 16 victims injured in the rampage, but thankfully he survived after a near fatal shot to the face. The 15 year old's heartbroken parents, Secret and Jason, recently opened up to CNN at the, after the traumatic event that killed their oldest child. Whatever that kid had going through his mind, I don't know, said Secret. But if he needed a friend, I know she would have been a friend to him and talked to him about anything he needed because that's just the kind of person she was. Bailey's parents and friends alike described the aspiring labor and delivery nurse as goofy and funny and super sweet with a smile that would light up the room. She was an angel here on earth, said Jason. She was a perfect angel. Her smile was so contagious, added her best friend, Johanna Davis. Everybody loved her. Nobody knew one bad thing about her because she was always positive. Though stricken by unimaginable grief, Bailey's parents have a surprisingly gracious attitude toward the boy who murdered their daughter. Akin to the likeness of Jesus, the Holtz have taken a merciful posture of prayer while also seeking that full justice is served. I don't know if I can go to court and see him. I just don't know if I can. But I want him to pay for everything he's done, said Secret, her mom. I also want to pray for him, too, because he know, I know he's probably having a hard time, too. But he took our baby. He still took my baby from me. We do not know when we will be called upon to stand to stand in front of somebody else and to share what we believe. Ten years ago, I'm actually 11 almost now, I met with the pulpit committee from this church. And I asked them to do something I thought was fairly simple. I asked them to go around the community and simply ask a few people, what do you know about Crestline First Baptist Church? I thought it would be helpful, first off, for me as a candidate for the pastorship here, that, that I would learn something about the church and what the community viewed. So I, I just said, committee, would you please do that? And then I said, and we'll talk next month about what you learned. We came back the next month, and what really troubled me was what, what, how they responded. I asked them, okay, please tell me what you learned. They hadn't learned anything. By the way, the, for anyone who was on that com committee, please don't take this personal. You know the facts are true, right? They hadn't learned anything because no one had talked to anyone. No one had talked to anyone. Now, I didn't think that should be that hard. 
because I even gave them these instructions. I said, please don't try to witness to anybody. Please don't try to convince anyone of anything. Please don't argue anything about the church and say, oh, no, it's not like that. Please just go and ask, what do you know about Crestline First Baptist Church? It'd be interesting if I gave you that instruction today and you went out to the community if you would do that. D is that really, was that really that hard of a task? Uh, I, I, it's a funny thing is, is that while I was here, I went down to the coffee shop that was uh, owned by somebody else and, and I just walked in there and said, hey, what do you know about the, that church behind you? And they shared some things about it, right? And about Crestline First Baptist Church with me. I learned some things like that. It, it really wasn't that hard to do. The following month, and, and, and I said, you know, you know, this is really important to me. The following month, I asked, okay, now how many did it? One of the people had set up an online survey. Well, that's neat, except that I was really wanting for the personal contact. I, didn't, I seriously was not asking them to do anything, to convince anyone of anything. I said, don't even, please don't invite anybody to the church. Just ask them what they think. You would have thought I had asked them to go out and share the four spiritual laws. Right. Or go out and ask your neighbor, if you were to die tonight and you stood in front of God, why should he allow you into heaven? I mean, because that's like really hard, right? Our fourth leg is sharing Jesus. We are called to share Jesus with other people. The Apostle Paul is standing here in front of King Felix and King Agrippa. Neither one of them believe in, in Jesus or in him. One of them, at least, Agrippa, actually knows the law, probably is a Jew, has even followed the prophecies. Paul, in another letter, in 1 Corinthians 15, says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was excuse me, raised on the third day according to scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and to the twelve. After that, he appeared to no, no more than, to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. That's 1 Corinthians 15. What's Paul saying? Paul's sharing with the Corinthian church. He said, I just got to tell you why I believe. Let me tell you why I believe, because look, this is what happened. By the way, critics um, said, theological critics uh, believe that uh, the New Testament, and particularly these words, were written some hundred years after Jesus died and rose from the dead. Enough time for the myth of the resurrection to be out there. Now, why do I say the myth? Because that's what then people started saying is, oh, it's just a myth. Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. It's just a story that, that grew over time, like you, know, like, like you all. Did, has anybody gone fishing lately? Caught a fish lately? And, and they usually they start out this way, and they kind of get bigger, as you, right? And, and, and our stories kind of do that, right? We all tend to exaggerate a little bit. It makes our stories more interesting. They may not be true, but at least people will laugh more, right? Well, and the fact is, is that, Paul, that, that theologians are saying, you know, there's just this myth that developed over a long period of time. But the problem is, is that the Bible wasn't written, the New Testament wasn't written 100 years after Jesus. In fact, do you know that the very words that I just read to you from 1 Corinthians were penned probably less than five years after the resurrection? Five years Myths don't develop that fast. Some of you are old enough to remember 9-11, right? Some of you young people have no idea what I'm talking about. But an attack on the United States at the World Trade Towers and, and also um, at the Pentagon and then a plane that went down out in Pennsylvania Forest. And, and because of that, many people joined the service and all. And, and you but the fact is, is that we don't have mythological stories about that yet, do we? Because we know that there were facts of what took place that day. And the same thing was true here. Five years after Paul is saying, I've got to talk about this. But now, where does Paul find, him, find himself? He says, in fact, open your Bibles if you have them with you to Acts, the 26th chapter. 
And we're going to begin reading verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. He's on trial. He has appealed to Rome already. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my dis defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. As Paul starts his trial before Agrippa, he simply says, okay, Agrippa, I know you understand a lot, and now I hope you'll listen to me. By the way, in order for Paul to have gotten to this point, he has to know a lot about Agrippa, doesn't he? He's gotten to know Agrippa well. May I just say that that's one of the important things about sharing Jesus with other people? Get to know the people that you're sharing Jesus with. Very, very few. In fact, let, let's just show a show, show, have a show of hands. How many of you accepted Christ because a stranger walked up to you and said, Jesus loved you, died for you, rose from the dead for you, and if you'll accept him, you can have eternal life. No one? Look at this. This, this is a church. Most of you are Christians, I believe, right? Probably maybe all of you. That's, that's, that, that's probably true. And yet not a single one of you came to Christ because somebody, a stranger, walked up to you saying, Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead from you, and you can invite him to live in your life. Not one of you have done that. Why? Because that's generally not the way God works. God works with relationships. And we build relationships with people and in the process of that relationship building. Now, the fact is, is that some of you may have gone to an evangelistic event. But the really cool thing is if you look back on it, God was already doing stuff that got you willing to go to that evangelistic event, wasn't he? You may have already, in fact, God knew it. <laughs> you were already in trouble. And God's already working on your heart. And, and now he's starting to draw you. And now you go to that evangelistic event. And we'll touch on that in a few moments as we continue. But I just want you to take note. Paul got to know and knew about Agrippa. And we need to get to know the people that we're sharing Jesus with. Paul goes on. In the next few verses, in verses 4 through 8, look at this. Paul says, I, I need to talk to you about the hope that I have as a Jew. And, and see, he's already connecting with Agrippa because he knows Agrippa has some of these same beliefs. So he says, you know, let me talk to you about what you and I believe, Agrippa. Wh what's important to us, Agrippa. And what does he say? What's important is the resurrection of the dead. We all want to know what's going to happen after people die. Is there anything else after this? Or do we come back as bees and bugs and something else? You know, are, are we just going to be reincarnated? Or, or are we going to actually go to some place which is real, that truly exists? Is there resurrection from the dead? Verse 4. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child. From the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion. And then he even says it. He says, I lived as a Pharisee. Oh, man, I was one of those strict religious guys following all of the rules to the dot and to the tittle. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am, an, am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night, King Agrippa. It is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider incredible, here's the hope, that God raises the dead? That's what Paul says. This is what really matters to me, and this is what gets him in trouble. In fact, he's, he kind of did this intentionally, by the way. There were some Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection. There's some Pharisees who do. They were fighting with one another, about to tear Paul apart, and he says, you know, this is because I believe in the resurrection. He knew it would get them even more upset, and they did. And now he's standing in front of Agrippa and says, that's why I'm here, because I believe in the resurrection. I want you to think about who this man is and what God did in his life. He was Saul of Tarsus. The Jewish people, Paul says, all knew who I was. They all knew how, who, how I lived. They knew my behavior. But look what God does in his life. God allows him to see a Christian with faith. Did you see it? If you look back in the New Testament, it, the scripture says that when, when um, Stephen was being stoned, 
that God allowed Saul of Tarsus to watch as Stephen dies. As Stephen cries out, I see the Son of God coming on the throne from heaven. And as he's looking at him and as he's being stoned to death, God allows Saul of Tarsus to watch this death, to give approval to the death. And God is starting already to tug at his heart. And what else does he do? Jesus confronts him in a supernatural way. In fact, there, you, you may not have had, like Paul, the light shining and blinded and all that kind of stuff, but if you came to know Jesus personally, you can think back on a moment. There was a time, there was something that God used to draw you towards him. I can remember still standing there at 12 year, 10 years old and just knowing something's happening. I've got to say yes to Jesus and walking down to the front of this big building where John Haggai was preaching, an evangelistic event at Chafee High School in Ontario, California, right over here. And I had to, just go, I had to go up there and accept Jesus Christ. And that was supernatural. Now, no, I didn't have the bright light shining, you know, and open up from heaven and say, Bill, Bill, why are you persecuting me? But I just knew that Jesus was calling me. Something supernatural happens in each person's life. And remember, that's because God's the one doing salvation, not you or me. But look, what else happened? Not only does Jesus confront him supernaturally, but Jesus prepares him to go tell the good news. He says, go to Damascus and wait, and Nicodemus will come to you. Jesus makes divine appointments, and he's doing that for Saul, isn't he? He's got a divine appointment already established for him to actually meet with Nicodemus, and then Nicodemus is going to pray over him. He's going to have his sight, and he's going to get to know God. What gives people hope today what gives you hope and watching a, t uh, a generation of young people that, that seem to be more despairing than any in the past uh, too many young people have committed suicide and continue that process too many are troubled and, and in deep depression. I mean, the amount of depression, and, and sadly, the amount of drugs because of the depression, trying to cover over that depression, trying to, the antidepressants that are being taken. There's so much stuff that's going on right now in our culture, and it's not just in this country, but it's around the world. The suicide rate in Japan, for example, is just intense. Why? Among young people, because they don't have hope. What gives you hope? What gives people hope? On what basis do you base your hope? Because aren't we supposed to give a reason for our hope to the people around us? What does Paul go on to say? He says, well, this was, what, this was what I hoped for. This is what this trial is all about. I hope for the resurrection. I hope that Jesus really is alive and there's something on the other side. That's my hope. But he goes on and he says, I, I was opposed. In fact, he said, not only was... I opposed Jesus Christ. He says, let me tell you about myself a little bit. And that kind of, there has to be a time when we're going to share about Jesus when we simply got to say, this is what's happened for me. And there is that kind of before Jesus time in your life. Now, some of you, I, I know some of you aren't like me. Some of you were goody two-shoes, never did anything wrong, hardly. Okay. Some of you are like me, and you have a lot of reason for Jesus to die on the cross for your sins, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but see, there's a, there's a time before you came to know Jesus, and you need to be able to talk a little bit about that time. And here's what Paul says. You know, I, here, let me tell you about my time before Jesus. I opposed him. I was a strict Pharisee. I was a religious man. I got into the details of this, and I opposed him. Verse, verse 9, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. He's now remembering stoning Stephen. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. He was on the Sanhedrin. He was a member of the ruling body. He had authority to command, to come cast a vote for somebody's death, and he was doing it. He says, Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme, which wasn't blasphemy because they were declaring that Jesus was God, but they considered it blasphemy. I was so obsessed with persecuting them, I even hunted them down in foreign cities, and that's when he was on the road to Damascus and Jesus meets him. And now he says, let me tell you why I believe. 
I believe because of what I saw. I believe because of what I've personally experienced. I believe because of Jesus. Verse 12. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground. Now, take notice of this. Paul wasn't the only one who saw this. The whole group, they're heading over to Damascus. They're going there to arrest Christians. The whole group of them. They all see the light. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. By the way, there's a description of evangelism, isn't it? I have appointed you to be as a witness and a servant of what you have seen and will see. We are called to simply share. This is why we call it share Jesus rather than force Jesus, right? R rather than argue Jesus, rather than make people believe in Jesus. It's just share. Share what you have seen, what you've experienced about Jesus in your life. See, I can argue all of your opinions, right? I can argue all of your judgments. But how do I argue your experience? And that's why we're called to share Jesus. Share what we've seen, what we've experienced. And he goes on. Now, I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant, and as a witness of what you've seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people. Yep, right here. And from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. By the way, it's the Spirit of God that does that. He's going to use Paul and Paul's story, and he's going to hopefully send, open up people's eyes to see and, from the, and to set them free from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. I'm sending you out there because I want to set people free. How did Jesus make himself known to you? How did he convince you of his love? What did he do to convince you of his grace? And how did he convince you that he was real? As you think about that, if you're able, that's what you simply need to share. What God did in your life. And so what does Paul say? He says, I obeyed the vision. <laughs> you know, when you have something supernatural happen like that, Paul says, you know, I wasn't going to ignore this one. And, he ha and, and, and incidentally, do you know that the Apostle Paul may be one of the greatest proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because he moves from this radical opposition to Jesus, he's killing Christians, to over here and saying, I'm going to die for you, Jesus. Evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He goes back to Jerusalem after he's done some growing. He meets with the disciples. He hears all the stories. He says, yes, I believe it. I believe it. And that's what he keeps sharing with this world and with the people around him. So then King Agrippa, now Paul's being personal. He says, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I have done what Jesus asked me to do. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. Notice, their deeds don't save them. Their deeds are a demonstration, evidence of the fact that Jesus Christ is living in them. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first 
to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. I've been commissioned and I'm following through. I've seen Jesus and I'm trying to share it with you. You see, we need to be obedient to the Great Commission. He said, look, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go out and make disciples of all nations. We need to obey and go. We need to obey when God sends us. And God's making divine appointments. The problem is some of you are saying no when he's making the appointment. You're sitting down next to somebody and, and, and they're, they're a friend of yours and they start sharing with you. Maybe you had lunch at work and they start saying, you know, oh man, I'm really having a hard time. And you know that you could pray for them right there, but you say no. Well, now, I, 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 we're at work here, and I, I shouldn't do that. I can't, uh, can't, you know, don't want to do something to sound weird, and this person might not like it. But what if you just said, could I pray for you? But there's people here listening. Yeah, and so is God. And the fact is, is that way too many Christians are saying no to doing the praying rather than the unchurched. It's not the unchurched who are saying, don't pray for me, I don't want it. It's the churched that are not going and saying, can I pray for you? And God is putting you in places where you're hearing needs that somebody else has, where they're going through some kind of struggle, some kind of challenge, and he's saying, just get next to them and encourage them. Maybe first off, start by giving them a hug, and then pray over them and pray with them. Right there in that moment, I won't know what to say. I think I heard something about Jesus, the Holy Spirit, would give us the words to say when we need to say it, right? I have a question. Is Paul crazy? Yes. <laughs> is Paul crazy or is he transformed? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Both of them is there. Acts 26, verse 24. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul. So remember, there's two kings sitting here, right? There's two, two governmental leaders, right? Festus and Agrippa are l listening to do. In fact, Agrippa said, I can't handle this guy, Paul, so Festus, you take him. He says, at this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. You're crazy, Paul! <laughs> and here's how Paul responds. I am not insane, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. Reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. Uh, and he's basically saying, Festus, I'm not crazy. Agrippa knows it. By the way, they've been there long enough that Agrippa does know he's not crazy. He knows that this is really true for Paul, that Paul really believes this, that it's made a difference in his life, and he's ready to die for it. He says, what I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? <laughs> By the way, now he's, now he's um, bridging to, to, to Agrippa, right? He knows what Agrippa believes. He knows he believes the prophets. And if you're going to witness to somebody else and really share Jesus with them, you've got to get to know them, don't you? You've got to get to know what they truly believe. You've got to listen. Paul's listened. And because of that, he can say, Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Come on, Paul. You, you think I'm going to give in to Jesus like that? And here's the challenge. Agrippa was that close. And Paul's saying, yeah, yeah, I do. Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. Standing there in chains, he says, I want you to be free. I know this doesn't look like freedom, but I'm free. And he says, I want you to be free like I'm free. I want you to experience what I'm experiencing, except for these chains. I want you to have the same thing. Yes, yes, Agrippa. I, if you'll do it right now, let's do it. <laughs> That's what God's inviting us to do. People may not understand what we believe. They may question what we believe. They, they may disapprove of what we've experienced, but they still need us to love them for Jesus Christ. Are you ready to put legs to your faith? 
to love God, encourage one another, grow as his disciple, and share Jesus. To love God means that you will share your faith. That you, you need to question your love relationship, by the way, with God if you're not sharing. Seriously, folks. If we're not sharing Jesus, we need to say, do I really love Jesus? If you're growing and you're putting legs to your faith, you're going to encourage others to grow when you're sharing what Jesus has done for you. And friends, you need to examine your love for others if you're not sharing. It's not just examine your love for God, but examine your love for other people. If we don't really care about other people, we're not going to share with them. Is hell real? Too many Christians hope it's not. And they're living on that hope rather than the realization and the hope that Jesus rose from the dead and the resurrection is true. So we don't want hell to be true, but it is. But the resurrection is true too. And life after death through Jesus Christ is available to all who believe. Are you, are you putting lakes to your faith? If so, you're going to be amazed at how much you will grow when you share your faith. It's the best way, by the way. Okay, So much better to, to grow by talking to somebody else about Jesus and you're like, I don't know how to answer. Better get back into the Word. Better study some more. Better pray some more. Better go ask for help. Okay? It, you will grow when you share Jesus with other people. But you need to test your ministry if you're not sharing Jesus. Can you really be a servant of Jesus if you're not sharing? And finally, God will change people when you share your faith. Because God's the one that saves us, not us. You heard it said, right? We are the salt of the earth. So get salty, kids. We're the light of the world. Then let your light shine. We're not supposed to go into the uh, entire world and make disciples. So get. Go. We're to be ready to give the reason for our hope. So what's your reason? Give it. We're to let the Spirit speak through us. So Spirit of God, speak. And you're all saying, chill. <laughs> no. Did Jesus die on the cross? Did he rise from the dead? Is he therefore the son of the living God, the Messiah? Then share Jesus. Dr. Ronald Skates, in 1999, stood in front of his congregation, Central Presbyterian Church in Baltimore, Maryland. He challenged them to think about the Great Commission, the responsibility that we all have. And he said, I'm quoting, you and I, if you are a believer here this morning, we need to be thankful. We need to be thankful because somebody somewhere was bold enough to gut it up and to take the risk of fulfilling the Great Commission, sharing the gospel with you and me. You, if you're a Christian today, became a Christian because somebody shared with you, and maybe many. Somebody went ahead and was brave enough to talk to you when you were obnoxious, rude, and hard-nosed, and stone-faced, and in opposition, somebody spoke to you. That morning, he thanked God for the life and witness of a gentleman named Edward Kimball. How many of you know Edward Kimball? Nobody. You should know Edward Kimball. Very famous man. Edward Kimball was determined to win his Sunday school class to Christ. A teenager in his Sunday school class was named Dwight Moody. Dwight used to fall asleep even in Sunday school class. He's bad enough during worship, right? But he's falling asleep during Sunday school class. Small groups, hard to do. <laughs> so Kimball, undeterred, set out to reach him at work one day. D Dwight was actually a shoe salesperson. So Kimball goes to him, heart pounding. He enters the store where the young man worked. 
He said, I, I put my hand on his shoulder, and as I leaned over, I placed my foot upon a shoebox. I asked him to come to Christ. But K- Kimball left thinking that he had botched the job, <laughs> that, that Moody had rejected Christ, but he didn't know. And when he left that store that day, that Moody left the store also a changed person, eventually becoming the most prominent evangelist in America. On June 17, 1873, Moody arrived in Liverpool, England for a series of crusades. The meetings were poorly at f- went poorly at first, then the dam burst and blessings began flowing. Moody visited a Baptist chapel pastored by a scholarly man named F.B. Meyer who at first disdained the American's unlettered preaching. But Meyer was soon transfixed and transformed by Moody's message. At Moody's invitation, Meyer toured America. At Northfield Bible Conference, he challenged the crowd saying, if you're not willing to give up everything for Christ, are you willing to be made willing? That remark changed the life of a struggling minister named J. Wilbur Chapman. If you're not willing to give up everything for Christ, Are you willing to be made willing? Are you willing just to let Jesus work on you? Good question for us today, isn't it? Chapman proceeded to become a powerful traveling evangelist in the early 1900s, and he recruited a converted baseball player named Billy Sunday. Under Chapman's eyes, Sunday became one of the most spectacular evangelists in American history. His campaign in Charlotte, North Carolina, produced a group of converts who continued praying for another such visit of the Spirit. In 1934, they invited evangelist Mordecai Ham to conduct a citywide crusade. On October 8th, Ham discouraged, wrote a prayer to God on the stage journey. It was Charlotte, Charlotte Hotel. Lord, give us a Pentecost here. Pour out thy Spirit tomorrow. His prayer was answered beyond his dreams when a central high school student named Billy Graham gave his heart to Jesus. Why did Dr. Skates thank God for Edward Kimball? He thanked God because Dr. Skates accepted Christ at a Billy Graham crusade as well. How many others were led to Christ and to substantial ministry through the ministry of Billy Graham or should we say how many others were led to Christ through the ministry of a Sunday school teacher named Edward Kimball and were afraid to share Jesus God, um, I can't help but thanking you for Edward Kimball because Alan Russell's got his name written in the Lamb's Book of Life because he too accepted Christ at a Billy Graham crusade. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, every single one of us has been somehow touched. It may have been a parent who forced us to go to church and we didn't want to go may have been a grandparent who gave us all that good food and just loved on us and prayed over us and pointed us to Jesus. It may have been a neighbor who invited us to vacation Bible school. It may have been um, a friend who said, hey, come with me to youth group. Um, but there's somebody in our life. It could have been somebody who said, hey, God's changed me. Do you want to be set free like, God, like what God's done for me? It could have been a drinking buddy. It could have, there's been so many different people that you've used, Jesus. For every single person here, there's been people that have shared Jesus with us. Please, Jesus, I pray for your Holy Spirit's anointing that we will share Jesus with the people around us. And that we'll not be afraid because when we need to share, when we need to give a witness, a testimony, when we need to stand in that courtroom and explain to somebody else why we believe and what we believe, your Holy Spirit will give us what we need. 
And that includes the courtroom of our best friend who doesn't think that there's a, a God at all. Oh, God, help us to let you work through us to share Jesus. And just before we conclude this prayer, Lord, if there's anybody here who needs to say yes to Jesus, the evidence is all there. You've even heard some of it this morning. You're here because God's been tugging at your heart. God loves you so much, cares about you. No, he knows you're not perfect. <laughs> he knows more about the details probably than you do about you. But he still loves you and he died for you on a cross. And he's inviting you to say, yes, I believe. Yes, I accept your love. Yes, I want you to come and be a part of my life. I don't understand it all, but I'm saying yes. I know it may trouble you that it's that simple, it's that straightforward, though. Yes, Jesus. So I invite you to say yes. And if this is the first time you've ever said yes to Jesus, would you tell somebody else, somebody that's with you, somebody else here in the room even, to say, I said yes to Jesus today. us to share what you've shared with us.